All right, welcome to Chance Bending. I am sitting here with Sean Goldvadden. Sean, how are you? I'm doing so good, Ben. Thanks for having us here. Yeah, I like it, man. So, Sean, you are part of one of the hottest growth firms here in Los Angeles. The rumor is you guys are building audience and and building revenue for startups across LA. Like you're you're almost like the I love this term, the Series A whisperer. <laughs> Can you confirm? Is that is that have have you guys been called the the Series A whispers? I don't think that uh, I've ever heard a startup call us the Series A whispers, but I I do think that um, as a team we're really positioned well uh, for Series A startups that you know maybe they've just hired their head of growth or they have a CMO um, that's been leading the vision of the team as they begin marketing. Um, and they are right in the cusp of um, maybe getting to that Series B round and are looking to scale their paid acquisition channels. And um, I find us to be a really good fit for those Series A and Series B startups that are looking to really scale out those paid acquisition channels. So what you're saying is there are startups out there, they're in search of their next round of funding. They've probably taken in some funding and they need to hit a certain level of revenue or maybe users. And that's when they call you. Yeah, correct. Uh, I think that what ends up happening in the world of growth or, or in paid acquisition is um, you tend to start, you know, by utilizing internal resources. So maybe you pull your head of product over to come up with some Facebook ads, uh, or you bring in maybe your head of operations to think through the right flows for running Facebook ads or, or Pinterest ads. Uh, but what, what ends up happening is um, most teams that start spending more money, you know, once you start spending hundreds of dollars a day, thousands of dollars a day, tens of thousands of day, uh, dollars a day, what ends up happening is you start exhausting these audiences. And so um, the difference between Facebook ads and Pinterest ads and all of these digital platforms versus radio and television and newspaper is that the feedback loops, the amount of data that you're getting in real time uh, is happening at such a different velocity that you're actually able to learn so much faster. And so what ends up happening is when you are spending lots of money and you're quote unquote exhausting these audiences, what ends up happening is your, uh, your return on that investment, your return on advertising starts to get less and less. And so what ends up happening is you as a team need to combat that by testing. And so testing new audiences, testing new platforms, should it be on you know, Instagram or Facebook? Should it be on iPhone or Android? Should it be male or female? Uh, people on the West Coast, people on the East Coast. And so uh, as you start going through these rapid testing iterations, you start to realize like, shit, I don't have enough team resources to actually execute this at a high level. If we start pulling that product designer into ad sessions every week to, to work across all of these different platforms, they're never gonna get anything done on product. If we have our head of growth spending you know eight nine hours a day trying to upload new facebook lists or upload new google adwords lists then they're not going to be focused on the high level metrics um and so i always tell companies or startups that coefficient labs is, is very much an in the weeds marketing team uh companies are really hiring us to uh dig deep 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 into the different platforms and understand what are the levers that we need to pull in order to change their growth velocity I, I can really relate to that. I mean, as an entrepreneur, my job is I, I, I start from zero, right? Like I've built so many different projects where you start from zero, you find an audience, you start talking to that audience and you're locked in. And it's a beautiful moment because you're, you're speaking their language and everything is clicking and vibing and the thing starts to grow. However, there inevitably comes that point when you have to find more users and more audience and more customers. And what you're saying is you guys help these startups, these larger companies expand their reach and start testing audiences that might be, you know, a little bit further away from that initial core audience set. Is that is that right? Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that you know, what I love about Coefficient Labs is, um, you know, we call ourselves a growth hacking agency, but but if you really define growth hacking, like what is growth hacking uh, for any of your listeners that, you know, are like, well, cool. So Sean works at a growth hacking agency. What exactly is growth hacking? Uh, if you go on the internet and you start looking around for the definition, what you'll find is a lot of different people have come up with their own versions or their own definitions of what is growth hacking. But the definition that you'll find the most amongst the top marketers is that 
growth hacking isn't any one thing or isn't any one job title, but rather it's a mindset. Um, growth is a mindset that when you start thinking about everything um, as as a funnel, right? Like you start at the very top, like people first need to, uh, they need to see your ad. You need to draw them in uh, and gain their attention if you want to sell them something. So first you have to show someone an ad with an impression and then they're going to click on the ad and then they're going to go to your website and they're going to add to cart and then purchase. But as soon as you think about business in a funnel uh, format, in a in a growth-minded format, um, that's when you're able to really move the needle for business. But what I have found is it's the exact same thing in life, right? When you're trying to lose weight, when you're trying to meet uh, new people, new relationships, build your network, it's the same exact process of constantly hitting, I think what you're talking about is like hitting a ceiling. You grow, you grow your, you know, maybe you're just starting out on Instagram, uh, you just started out a business, maybe you're in, you know, sports or you're thinking about maybe starting your own line and you kind of get that first little bump and then things start to stagnate. That's like hitting the ceiling. And sometimes like, you know, maybe when you're trying to lose weight, you end up hitting that ceiling and you've got to come up with new ways to break through. I think that um, that is where Coefficient Labs finds itself is right at the point when, you know, we've tried a lot of different angles and a lot of different avenues, but we've hit that plateau and we need a team to come in and really rethink it from the ground up. And, and that's where we, we come in. I think that's awesome. It's, uh, it's, it's an interesting moment in time here in 2019 because it feels like more than ever, if you come up with the right thing at the right time, you just blow up so quickly. On the other hand, in 2019, it's never been harder. There is so much content out there. There's, there's so many voices. It's busy. You're competing against the entire world. How do you think about that? Like, I, I, I just think that uh, for me personally, I'm just, I'm always striving to find something new and unique and that's becoming harder to do. So, so how do you as a professional, how do you guys think about that as a, as a business? So I think there's two specific ways of going about it. The first way is something maybe some of your listeners that listen to Gary Vaynerchuk, I'll probably end up mentioning his name a couple of times throughout this podcast. But for those of you that that follow Gary Vaynerchuk, he talks a lot about reverse engineering. So a lot of times people that are starting a new business say to themselves, like, I've got all these ideas that I, I want to try this. I want to try that. Even on this podcast, right, we were talking about like, what are some cool innovative formats that we could do? And so a lot of times people start almost at the very beginning and they come up with all of these ideas that they could um, that they could do. Um, and many, many times entrepreneurs don't have the right testing frameworks in place. And so they end up going in lots and lots of different directions. And a couple months go by, three months, six months, 12 months, and they're like, where the fuck did the time just go? I, I haven't made that growth. And so the first thing that I would talk about is reverse engineering. Who are the people that you have watched do this, have watched grow in, you know, if you're selling, you know, chapstick, who are other startup chapstick companies that have actually had the same trajectory as you and try to reverse engineer what they've done. And so I think a lot of people start from the get and try to come up with the new way of doing things when really if they take that step back and they reverse engineer what's worked really well. And I think that's why you see the videos like Dollar Shave Club that was really, really innovative in and of itself. But uh, you follow and there's like Dollar Beard Club and all these other videos now are trying to do the exact same thing. And the reason is, is because it really works. And so I think the first aspect for those that are trying to leapfrog when they're first getting started is don't feel like you have to have the original billion dollar idea right off the bat, but rather study those that have already been there, study those that have already had the same sort of hurdles that you've had and then you will be able to understand like what was it about that campaign that made it work so well. And we do that all the time. We will analyze our old campaigns from other clients and try to understand what was it about that that worked so well and how do we uh, move it into uh, another client or another campaign. And, and so I, while the first point is reverse engineer, the second point is actually something that, Ben, you had brought up on your podcast maybe one or two episodes ago, I can't recall, but you talked about these like three key uh, elements of growth or of success and it's learning, practicing and understanding. And I think like that's something that people, even though it makes sense in that framework, 
they maybe don't spend as much time like truly thinking about the importance of it because what makes coefficient labs different or what makes us uh, special is really the fact that we have brought uh, what would normally be considered in product development, agile or scrum development, where every single week or every two weeks you're working in a sprint. So every week we're trying new things, we're testing new audiences, new creatives, um, new modeling, but everything at Coefficient Lab is all about learning and testing. And every single week we're testing anywhere between five and 20 experiments, sometimes even more on an individual client account. Uh, and so the first get the first um beginning piece is like getting yourself in a learning mindset where you're like i don't know shit i don't know anything i'm a beginner here and i think a lot of people um that start a business feel like they're the experts or they're the master and so they don't even allow themselves to get into the mindset that lets them learn um the second part's about practicing like so many people spend all their time sitting in a room thinking about ideas talking to their friends about ideas like what if i do this what if i do that but really like it comes down to executing it and practicing it and trying new things. And, and so, um, you know, one of our core values at Coefficient Labs is to have a bias towards action and testing. Like when in doubt, try, try something, learn from it, practice it. And then the most important part to your point is understand it, reflect on it. Why did this work? Why didn't it work? Um, another tip, and I'll, and I'll throw this as, as a, a far third, but I, yeah, sorry. A, go bonus, on. a bonus, a bonus, tip. yes, a bonus, a bonus tip, pre-mortem. So pre-mortem, this is a term that we use at Coefficient Labs all the time, but most people will do a post-mortem. Things will go bad for whatever reason, and they'll sit around a room like we are right now and say like, shit, that didn't work. What did we do? What could have been, what could have um, gone better, right? It's that understanding part. And while like that is, you know, a players will get to that understanding part. I think that A plus players, right, that that top percentage will do what we call a pre-mortem. And a pre-mortem is where you sit around and you say, let's pretend like everything we're about to do this week fails. Like that, this idea we're going to do just fails miserably. What are we going to do about it? What's the learning that we can almost play that game of chess, right? Like if we make this move and then this happens and then this happens, like, what are we going to do? And I think that by positioning in your head, like every week you're sitting down and you're thinking about, okay, so next week we're going to be trying these two or three new things so that we could learn, so we could practice. But what if those things don't work? Like our clients don't care if they don't work. They don't care how hard we're trying. And so I think a lot of entrepreneurs wait until things go bad before they start to understand and analyze. Whereas in some cases, you almost want to flip the script and start understanding before you even start learning and practicing because it's all part of the process. That's dope. I feel like uh, what you're saying, I, I mean, it really hits home. I, I know for me and as as I've grown chance bending, uh, you know, some of the things that I've shared with with our employees is like, look, we don't know. We are going to look at other people and we're going to reverse engineer what they're doing. And that's why you'll see us experiment with like Gary stuff. You'll see us experiment with everybody under the sun. We'll, we'll go there. We, and I don't mind doing that, but that's not our goal. Um, our goal is to, like you say, to test. And if you're methodical about testing, you're going to learn and you're going to learn ultimately what makes you different. And it's your uniqueness that ultimately shines through. And that process seems backwards because you would think you would start with how you're unique and then apply it the other direction and, and sort of copy people. But what I found in startup life is, no, you actually start copying people. Then you apply what's unique. And that's happened for me through the premortem, through, through like thinking through what are we doing and being really exact uh, every, every week. So I, I, I love that. And I think that uh, could, could you give us an example of where a premortem helped you ahead of time? Yeah. Uh, so I think that when you're in the world of performance marketing, you know, something I just mentioned a minute ago, like when you're in the agency world or where, where you're in the servicing service business, especially in advertising, like there's always a way to, to paint the pig in a better light. But at the end of the day, clients have very specific metrics they care about, right? Like lowering the cost per install or lowering the cost per purchase. And so when you work like Coefficient Labs does in an agile 
weekly format. So every single week for 12 weeks in a row, um, what, what we do is we run a 90 day sprint. So startups work with coefficient labs on a 90 day sprint and we break that sprint up into 12 weekly sprints. So every single week we are coming to the table, uh, you know, with our feet held to the fire, like, are we hitting our goals? Are we moving towards it or are we moving away from it? And so I think that um, we're always pre-morteming because of the fact that there is accountability. And I think that uh, one of the changes that is that is happening as we speak, and I do think that Coefficient Labs is one of the agencies that's really pushing the tempo in transparency to clients, is like the advertising world is a black box. Um, when you work with bigger advertising agencies, the real big companies managing hundreds of millions of dollars, millions, they don't want to to per, uh, they don't want to communicate based on performance. They don't want to talk about clicks. They don't want to talk about conversions and purchases. They want to talk about high level metrics like the amount of impressions or how many people viewed or viewed through on an ad. Um, so I, I think that the the pre mortem is is ever evolving. Like you're constantly checking yourself to see you know uh, if this doesn't work then how are we gonna act? And so I guess a perfect example for those of you um, that are currently running Facebook ads, let's say that you're running a Facebook ad and your goal is to get someone to click on that ad and have them fill out you know, some information on your website, like their name, their phone number, their email address. But let's just say it's like the, the end goal is not for them to buy a product, but to give you some information. Many of you that have been doing that, right? Maybe you've been sending a bunch of traffic to your landing pages and for whatever reason, I don't know, 3%, 5%, 10%, 20% of the people um, actually become a lead. And so traditionally, I would go to the client and say, hey, you know, we spent $1,000. Uh, we got, you know, 20% of all of the, the clicks. We got 1,000 clicks. 20% of them uh, became a lead. So we got you, you know, 200 leads or 20 leads or whatever that is. Now, um, a way that you could pre-mortem that is to say, okay, well, let's pretend that that landing page that we're sending people to just doesn't work. Like this great idea we have doesn't work and those people don't fill out. And it's not a 10% or a 20% conversion rate, but it's a 3% or a 1%. Well, if that's true, we're fucked next week. And so there are um, tactics, right? Like there, for, for any of you that are messing around on Facebook ads, there's something called a Facebook lead ad. And what's special about the lead ad is that it actually connects with people's Facebook accounts. So if let's say Ben is on Facebook and he's scrolling down and he clicks on a lead ad, rather than this uh, ad taking you to a landing page or to a website, it's actually going to pull up this little modal right then and there in the Facebook platform but because Facebook knows what your ID, they know what your email address is, they know what your phone number is, they can actually pull that information directly into the form. And so it's an example of, you know, if our goal is to lower cost per lead and one of our tests is to drive traffic to a landing page, we may pre-mortem that out and say, if this doesn't work as a backup plan, we're going to have a lead ad ready to launch on Thursday and that might be able to save us over the weekend. And so that's kind of an example of where we may use a pre-mortem to help us uh, for next week. That's sweet. That I I was so excited to to have you guys come in here and describe the process to to our audience because our audience, um, I, I just want them to to see how much science and how much like this is a real this is pro ball, right? Like this is this is this is real deal. I, I appreciate it. I think what is making, I like, I think, you know, as someone that has ego in this, this is my passion. I've been doing this for a really long time. Um, you know, I definitely would like to think that we're pushing, you know, yeah, this is, this is the pro leagues. I would like to think that, and we are managing hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of media spend in some cases. And so, um, the stakes are very high. The pressure is very high, but it doesn't change the process. And the process is learning practicing, understanding, learning, practicing, understanding over and over and over and over again until you start to see these trends. And, and I think the trends is what feeds into what you were just talking about. I think on uh, on the last podcast or on one of them, you were talking to Amir and uh, you were talking to- you know, Man, you, you've done your homework on me. I, I, <laughs> I, I am impressed. Thank you. We uh, You were talking to Amir and, and he was saying something along the lines of how like, he wasn't really put on this earth 
to like be the sales business guy. Like he's a storyteller. He's a creative person. And I was talking to Steve as we were listening to that. And it's like, that's the world that's changing is that they're for so long have been all of these creative agencies. And that's what they do is they are storytellers. They write narratives. They come up with protagonists. They, they have keyed in on how to tell a compelling story. But the problem is they're in a totally different world, mostly in a different business than the media team and the analytics team. And so there's no communication happening between these two teams. And so what ends up happening is there's like this kind of old creative way of like, this is how it should be done. The story should always be like this. And I don't care what the data is telling me because it's got to hit these emotions. And then you have this newer school, like these 19 year old kids, you're, you're saying that it's everything's about data and nothing is about the story like that. The story is all ego. Like are people watching it and, you know, talking about Netflix and like that shit's real when people drop off after 30 seconds because of how you presented content, like good luck getting them back. And same with podcasts, like attention is everything, right? Yeah. I, I think the, the lines have blurred, right? Where like the New York times in the old days, like the, the editorial and the business were just completely separate, didn't even know each other. It didn't want to know each other. And now I think the best performing teams, the best performing startups, um, even for, for me as entrepreneurs, like the best entrepreneurs somehow know how to walk the line between business and content and media. And, and so for me, like that's the line I'm trying to walk. Uh, I view myself as a business person first, a content creator second, but that's no longer in 2019 an excuse for me not to put out amazing, creative, professional content. And so I'm trying to get over that hump. And I think it's interesting that you guys are coming in and, and helping people. I, I would say you're sort of like not a band aid because I think that there's a connotation of like, there's something wrong, but I would say, and it's more than glue. I think it's this idea of like uh, con connecting in a positive long-term manner, like what needs to be put together, so to speak. Yeah. And I, I think that it's even, it's accelerated in that most of these startups, right? Being series A, being series B, like you have gotten past in many cases that early product market fit. Like, is this even an idea worth looking at? And so most of our clients are spending 30,000 a month, 50,000, $200,000 a month more, you know? And so the idea is less about like, is this even an idea that uh, they should be running with and more an idea of how do you bring all of this amazing DNA that is your company and, and uh, communicate that to your target audience. And I think that there's just this, this gap between fundamentally understanding the marketing, you know, the product, the positioning, the messaging, just all of the basic marketing um, uh, attributes. But then you start like getting more complex. Once you go into the Facebook platform or into Pinterest and you start getting hit with things like character count limits, or like your ad can only have 20% text in the ad. And you're like, whoa, well, what are all these limitations on the creative? Or if you use specific words that potentially could, you know, denounce a specific race or that, that you could actually have your whole advertising account disabled. And so I think that there's a misconception around the high level marketing and the low level in the weeds of like how you actually are executing at scale um, in a platform that wasn't built really for advertising, right? I mean, advertising came later, but Facebook is a social network. Instagram is a place for people to share photography. So these are really, really delicate platforms uh, to work off of. But I, I think it comes back to this, you have to marry the data and the creative. Like, uh, to your point before, everyone, like Gary Vee says, everyone has to be a media company now. Like you got to have a podcast, you got to have a newsletter, you got to have content. But if you, I mean, look, you have employees, you have a staff, you understand that if I have these editors work for 20 hours, that's a cost to me, right? Or to you. And if no one watches that content, well, joke's on me. And so I better learn what kind of data is telling me uh, who's my audience. And, and I think that it's such, you know, that's a, a positive of social media is being able to communicate on a daily basis with your actual customers. I think there's a ton of negatives surrounding social media, but but certainly one of the positives is you have the ability to learn about your customers, not just sit in a room with a bunch of other marketing people thinking about it. 
can you guys give us an example of uh, someone you blew up that 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 you killed it for? Is do you, do you have that? We we also have uh, Steve Root, Rootsy. Yes, sir. Steve Rootsy here from Coefficient Labs. Do do you guys have? Do you have someone that you that you killed it for that you can talk about? Just maybe in broad strokes. Yeah, you know, a couple companies that come to mind: um, Novo, which is a, a banking platform um, that is specifically uh, built to help startups um, founders grow. Um, I think Novo is a is a great example. Uh, we're working right now with a company called Legacy Shield. Um, company called Connected is really exciting. I think Connected um, over the last six months uh, has been a, a amazing success story for Coefficient Labs. Um, this is a uh, one of the co-founders, um, early early co-founders. I don't believe he was one of the first founders, but one of the early co-founders of Hired.com. Um, he was a Pivotal Labs developer. Uh, joined Hired as one of their first engineering uh, resources and actually started his business um, taking, you ever seen like, maybe you have it in your house or your parents have it, like uh, when you walk into a house and there's like a wired alarm system. Absolutely. You know, and you go and you got to push like the 2468 or whatever your passcode is and like it beeps and then, you you know, it kind of turns your alarm on and off. And so uh, if you're like my family or you know people, these alarms have been sitting unused, stagnant for years and years. Like everyone has these wired alarm systems, but they actually don't use them because they don't want to pay the monthly bills or, or whatever. And so Connected actually took a chip, an electronic chip that he built, and you uh, take this chip, you put it into your circuit breaker, and you connect it to a smart hub device, and you can actually turn your alarm at your house on and off from your cell phone using your old wired alarm system. So you don't have to actually get a new unit uh, like a Nest or anything, but basically you can just have your normal system running. Uh, and that is a company that we scaled uh, well above $100,000 in revenue per month. And, and they were doing in the mid, you know, the mid four or five figures. So, wow. Yeah, this was a, a very, very big success and uh, excited to see uh, Nate and Connected and the team continue to grow as uh, I believe they're launching a series of new products this summer. Wow. So if if uh, my audience is out there and they're like, wow, Coefficient Labs, Sean and Steve are just, you guys are killing it. How should they start to think about it? If they're sitting there, they're, they might have an idea. They might be trying to get something off the ground. Like what's what's popping in 2019? Like well, what are you guys thinking about? Like are there platforms? Are there, are there things you're sort of looking at that you're like, wow, I think this is happening right now? Yeah, I think LinkedIn's happening right now for sure. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm just like, I'm – a hundred percent LinkedIn. Like mm -hmm. it, it's crazy and it's it's a really unique opportunity right now. Yeah, I tell like my little brother who likes to play around with the stocks and like I don't have any money in the stock market, but I feel very, very, very overly bullish right now on LinkedIn. Um, like I did in Facebook six years ago. I'm watching our clients shifting budget out of AdWords and into Facebook. I'm watching them shift budget out of Facebook into LinkedIn. Um a lot of people think that LinkedIn is just a place right now for business connections like it was six years ago, three years ago, whatever. Uh, but it is turning into a heavy hitter content platform. Um, it's an amazing way if you're in the B2B space to grow your list. Uh, it's an amazing way to produce content that has a high view count. Um, a, a lot of these channels, this is another great piece of advice, guys. When you hear of a new feature being brought, whether it's to LinkedIn or Pinterest or Facebook, like whatever the reason is, and, and I'm happy to maybe send you some links on, on blogs that we follow to keep in the, in the know. But when they launch these new features, like Facebook Live or Instagram Live or Instagram Live is, I'm sorry, uh, Instagram TV is now kind of, you can integrate it into your organic feed. But when they launch something new, you got to take advantage of it. Those are the sorts of things where it's so underutilized. There's so, you know, attention, going back to attention being everything, uh, Facebook and Instagram are motivated to keep your attention on the platform. So when they come out with new features and new things for you to try, it's totally on you to utilize those. And so I, I think another thing that's uh, really popping right now, if you have any clients or if you have any friends or entrepreneur or colleagues that are selling products or, you know, maybe have their own little store, Facebook launched a new ad unit maybe eight months ago called Collection Ads. It's almost like a carousel, but it sort of has one main feature, image or video, and then a series of smaller kind of uh, images below it. And 
uh, I would say that, you know, if you are in the, the, that space, moving away from just doing newsfeed ads and starting to try like canvas ads or trying to start uh, to learn more about these collection ads, um, not only are they really good, uh, effective tools uh, for you to use for advertising, but they're new. And they're the type of thing that Facebook will give a lot more juice to. You'll get a lot more bang for your buck. Uh, Instagram story ads are you know, definitely an area where people uh, could be spending more time building native content for. Um, I think that's, you know, something for for your viewers is to understand that, like, when you post a ad on Facebook, and then you bring that ad into Instagram, and you keep the exact same diameter, like the same uh, sizing, it's not native. And so it looks different on Instagram than it does on Facebook, it'll look different on LinkedIn and Twitter. And, and so I think just being as native to the platform as you as you possibly can um, is is definitely a piece of advice. And then I would say the last thing um, I'll say on this for direct uh, advice is if you are able to get video testimonials, I think that's kind of the content of 2019 um, for let's call it the majority. There, I think there's two types of content. I love this. I love this. Keep going. This is great. This cool. Is great. So I think there's two types of content that you're going to see a lot more of this year. Well, let's let's say three types, but the two main ones. The first are these like 3D pastel drop shadowy kind of you can just tell that the the design style is moving to 3D. So think like Pixar or like it's it's just moving in that direction. Uh, Coefficient Labs is right now in the series of looking into and interviewing 3D candidates um, to continue to push the tempo. Is is that like those images you can you can like change your image when you upload to Facebook? Like the emoji type. Yeah, so, yeah. so so that's an example. But um, I'll show you after the podcast like some visual examples. But you can just tell it's it's different. It's right, we'll it, put we'll put those into the notes. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but for so I would say like that's for like the agency world. That's something that we're looking at for our clients because it's different. How do we stand out from the crowd and be different? Um, so number one is this 3D pastel style. Um, I think that's the design trend of this year. I, I sent a message out to my team a couple of weeks ago and I said, guys, like this is the this is the trend right here. You you need to see it. Um, the second aspect around uh, around this pastel style is in these um, low quality production video content. Yeah, I mean, this is what we've been doing actually behind the scenes is like we're doing raw video ads. The rawer, the better. Mm -hmm. And the rawer, the better. So, and like you said, with like a native Instagram format and Instagram stories, and uh, it looks like influencer content and it, it, it just performs a million times better than anything else. That's right. Companies come to us, right? And they'd say like, hey, so we've got this sort of content, like it's been performing really well, but we start to stagnate, right? Like we, we, we don't have more... This is where having a team like Coefficient Labs is uh, really useful because I think that there are strategic decisions that at a high level maybe feel a little cloudy or don't make sense. But when you like really dig in, you're like, oh, damn, I could see how that works. And so uh, an example of that is on Facebook, there is something called a video view custom audience, a video view custom audience and a custom audience is basically think of it like a bucket of people. Um, you know, you personally don't know who these people are, but just consider this audience to be a bucket of people. And you can create this bucket of people a lot of different ways on Facebook. Uh, you can upload a list of email addresses and phone numbers that could create a custom audience. Um, you could have your pixel on your website. So anyone that hits your website or goes to a specific page, that could be a custom audience. But what I'm talking right now about is video view custom audience. And a video view custom audience says that I'm going to launch an ad, a video, a uh, video ad, whether it's on Instagram or Facebook, and I want a bucket, a custom audience to be made of all people that have watched 75% of this video or more. I want a video or I want a custom audience of people that have watched 10 seconds or more of the video. And what ends up happening if you really get strategic and you you kind of think like a one or two levels deeper is how do you layer creatives on top of each other using audiences that have already seen bits and pieces of old content. So maybe you have someone that watches the entire your your entire uh, segment we then take those people and we put them into a retargeting audience. And then every day we feed them a new video testimonial from new people. So 
you know, for you, Ben, maybe after the podcast, hey, you know, this is Sean. I just had a great time on Ben's podcast. For anyone thinking about, you know, jumping on, you should do it. Now, rather than you showing that spot out to the world, people that have never seen me before, they have no idea who I am, might be a waste of money. But if you retarget your current audience with my video, they've already consumed some of yours. So there's, um, these are the sorts of tactics, right? It's not the strategy, but it's a tactic of how can you take what a team has already done and sort of uh, growth hack it? How do you, how do you leverage so it? So sweet. I mean, we, we have been talking about this idea of like maybe through retargeting, like we, we show through video chance bending, like, you know, I, I do business consulting and coaching that we take someone from, from nothing to something and we show that through retargeting so that the person gets more information, more knowledge, and starts becoming successful through the video ads itself. And so you see that person go from point A to point B over time. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that it is, it's part of the culture and, and this is part of the challenges that I have. Um, really the biggest mm -hmm. challenge that I have is in attribution and in tracking. I think that's the, uh, the hardest thing to do is to take credit. You know, if someone sees an ad on Facebook and they click on the ad and maybe they're being driven to a, a website where they have to buy like a couch or they have to buy furniture, it's a thousand dollars, but 1500 bucks, whatever it is. How likely are you, you know, sitting on the toilet, looking at Instagram, are you going to buy right then and there? Right. And so many, many, many people, many marketers, many companies, depend on multi-touch attribution. Well, they see us on Facebook, they watch a little video, they click to our website, they bounce over to the podcast, then they check out Google, and then the next thing you know, they somehow have come through and they're a lead for your consulting business. And so this multi-touch attribution, when Coefficient Labs, you know, I mentioned we do 90-day sprints, so we're fighting for our life for that 90 days. It's a core difference that separates us from other teams is you know, we don't have a one-year contract. We don't have a two-year We have 90 days to prove ourselves. And as a result, we have to be agile. We have to come up with new creatives every week. We have to come up with new uh, data sets every week and new audiences every week. Um, that's how we've built this business and why I think we're successful because each client is changing client to client and new challenges and Facebook is changing their algorithm, what seems to be every week right now. But the process of trying new things learning from the data and then understanding and reflecting on how to make it better, like that process, uh, I think will stay true for years to come. So for, for our audience out there, I don't want them to feel too intimidated, uh, and overwhelmed. If, if they're just getting started, what's the key idea in principle? I mean, I, I, I think part of it is just this idea of testing things. Mm -hmm. Um, do you, do you have advice for people just on a really simple level? Yes. So my first piece of advice for anyone that's getting started or even for people that have already gotten started but feel like they're still like a little bit lost on this is to understand that step zero and step one is to ensure that your tracking and your analytics are set up correctly. I can't tell you how many people start by thinking of ideas on how they can grow their company before they have for sure with no question check to ensure that like they're actually tracking this correctly because what ends up happening is you have all of these smart people coming up with all of these ideas but then in hindsight they have no way to know if those ideas actually led to the result and so i would say like it's not a shiny thing right it's not like this one particular thing that your viewers should go out and do it should be like if you are listening to this and you're not 100% positive that you've done everything you can to install the right analytics and tracking with your goals and your events, like that should be step one. And a lot of people think to themselves, okay, cool, so I've got to set this up. Like, where do I get it set up? Or like, who's going to do this for me? Go to Fiverr.com, F-I-V-V-E-R. I, -V -V -E -R. I think, it, think that's what it is, but Fiverr, yeah. Yeah, two R's. Two R's, Fiverr with two R's. Go there, type in Google Analytics Specialist, type in Facebook Pixel Specialist, type in, and there are 100 people for 15 or 20 bucks that will make sure that this thing's installed. So that's like my first piece. It's such dope advice. I, and it's so true. And it's something I had to go through. And I, I love that it's just so actionable, which is get tracking set up. 
get it set up so that way you can get into this mindset of testing, get into this mindset of doing things, trying things, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. Because I, I can tell you, I get probably five to 10 people a week that are like, hey, Ben, I want to start a podcast. Tell me how to start a podcast. And then we inevitably start talking about marketing and traffic. And and it's like, if you don't know what's going to work or you don't know where people are coming from and you're like, well, it, iTunes just says I have uh, 25 people. Like you, you, you have to understand. And once you understand, then you can start doing things. Like, I think I just came up with this analogy, but I'm digging it right now in my head, which is it's kind of like going to the gym without putting on your right shoes. Like, like you just want to get to the gym and start like getting into it. And so in the, in the heat of like getting to it all, you just throw on like whatever kicks you out from work, but then you get there and you're like, shit, my ankles hurt. Or like, I don't know why I'm not like getting, I'm not able to run as much as I could have run. Oh, I'm wearing the wrong fucking shoes. And I feel like that's the sort of thing that's happening in analytics is like, they're like, ah, well, let's just get the baseline set up. Like, let's just get it up. We'll get the pixel up, they say. And then like, we'll figure it out on the fly. Six, eight months go by. Things are going well. Like they know the bottom line is getting better, but they don't know if it was because of Facebook, if it was because of Valentine's Day, if it because of, you know, this one influencer that made a post. And so I would just say is like step zero and one, and it's the most unfun step is just make sure that your analytics are set up uh, if, correctly. If, if our audience is having trouble, I would just say if there's one thing you could do, it is use tracking URLs, whether that's bit.ly or if you understand UTM sort of stuff, like just do that. That's one. And then two, use the Facebook pixel and get that thing installed. Those are the two things. I, I mean, there's more, but I think those are the two yeah. Two really big things. Those are those are the two things. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, if you are sitting here listening to this and you're like, okay, I definitely have Google Analytics set up, but I'm not sure if I have the Facebook pixel set up or like I think I do, but I'm not positive. I would go to Google. I would type in Facebook pixel helper. It's a little Chrome extension. It will tell you whether or not you have the Facebook pixel set up. It's very, very simple. It's either green if it's on or not green if it's off. Um, but to Ben's point, that's that's the key is, um, you know, as far as analytics is concerned, you cannot do anything effective if you don't believe in the numbers and you don't believe in that uh, by doing X, Y, and Z thing, it's going to lead to this result. And so uh, knowing your analytics is just, it's so, so, so important. It's even more important when you start spending money. So when our clients are spending tens of thousands of dollars, they need to know where the money is being put to. And, and I'm sure for anyone that's just getting start up, you know, that doesn't have venture funding, that doesn't have millions of dollars, like it's even more important for you to know where your money's going. Um, and I actually think that's the number one reason that people aren't pushing harder on Facebook. Uh, I do a lot of mentoring for 500 startups and for other accelerator programs. And I'm like shocked at how many times I'll sit in a room, they have an amazing product, an amazing team, their Facebook ads, when I review and audit their account, are working and they're actually making money. But because they don't understand this framework of learning and testing and learning and testing, they, they just haven't thought through it. They're too afraid to take that step. They're like, I don't want to spend all this money. What if it doesn't work? And so I think that this step one and step zero, right, of getting the analytics set up, making sure your Facebook pixel is set up, like that's just, it's the key and most important but then after that, and this is, again, staying probably too high in the clouds and not enough in the dirt, is like this mindset of like testing every week, testing every day, you know, allowing yourself to kind of get back into this mindset of like, I have no idea if this is going to work or not, but I'm going to try it and I'm going to do it with $20. And because I'm my analytics are set up correctly, I'm going to know if this works. It's, I think that, you know, everything else uh, all of the other tactics, all of the other quote unquote hacks all come after you get to this place where A, you believe your data and two, that you are committed to a ongoing process of learning and testing. This is such a good episode. I feel like, like we, 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 we are on a journey and if, if our audience is listening, if you have questions, like I feel so passionately about this, like literally just DM me or like message me on Instagram if you have a question on this and I'm, I'm just going to paste a link in to you. I like, but I just feel like we, we, you need to do this. And it, it's just been a great episode. Sean, wh where can people go to find out more about coefficient labs, more about you guys? 
Uh, you guys are out of Santa Monica, California. We are. We are. So, um, Coefficient Labs is out of Santa Monica. We're we're headquartered down on the promenade. Um, uh, you can find us at coefficientlabs.com. You can follow us on the socials uh, at Coefficient Labs. Uh, if you're into following kind of the founder's journey and uh, the ups and the downs of building a business, early mornings, late nights, you can follow me at Sean Goldpen. Um, and uh, yeah. Would uh, would love to connect uh, with any of you uh, off offer online. You guys have to watch out for Steve as well. Steve is like a master. He's everywhere on the internet, so he's probably already looking for you, ready to talk to you. So th- there's just a, a little warning. Like when I came across these guys, I like I'm like man, Steve is everywhere. Steve, what's your what's your official title? I'm the director of VC partnerships. And when you guys were talking about LinkedIn a little bit earlier, I thought I'm pretty sure that's how we met. Yeah, I mean, these guys are good. These guys are really good. Like, like I, I, it, I feel like it's my job to know who's sort of hacky around LA and around sort of our space. And I'm like, why does this name Coefficient Labs just keep popping up? And why does this guy Steve keep popping up? And it was like, oh my god, these guys are everywhere. So, um, I, look, I don't like kissing too much ass, so I'll just leave it at that. But uh, I, I, you know what? I just really appreciate you coming in here. I feel like you give a bunch of great information for everybody. I know there's some stuff I need to get on that you're describing. So uh, I, I just appreciate the time. Yeah, man. Ben, really uh, appreciate your time as well and looking forward to the next one. We'll have you uh, come over on our podcast. Oh, awesome. Let's let's do that. And as well, next time, let's do some video and actually show people some cool stuff. Cool. I actually have a question for you about yeah. the, the the podcast that we're running. I'm curious to know your thoughts on it. So we um, have been kind of noodling around on what like the angle or what's the positioning for us. Like, who do we want to be speaking to on our podcast and in our content and uh, this world of um, companies and startups that are currently or thinking about or have already gone through uh, the process of going through an accelerator program like Y Combinator, Mucker Labs. um, And the name of the podcast is Demo Day. And the idea is that we would bring on members like yourself that have been through a program or that have been uh, in the world of that and uh, try to help founders um, prepare for and demystify this idea of demo day, um, how they can set their campaigns up in that, you know, 12 week period leading up to it. Um, And really just kind of from the VC's perspective, what's it like going through that process? What's it like um, interviewing these, um, you know, up and coming startups? I'm curious to know your thoughts just on demo day um, in general um, to niche or do you like where it's going? Yeah, no, I I, I love the concept. I I think that it's really powerful. I mean, the the idea that um, these accelerators try to compact learning into a very short time period. And in some sense, that's what you would be doing in a podcast. So I like this idea of like, how much can we squeeze in, in a conversation with you all so that if you're out there and you're curious, you're learning, if you've been through the experience, like I have no, you know, I, I do some advising with uh, Mucker Capital and the, and the Mucker Accelerator program here in Los Angeles, but I'm still pretty far away from that. You know, I went, mm-hmm. I, I worked with them, you know, officially in 2012 or 2011 maybe but i'm still as interested as ever in what that is and that process so i would definitely be a a listener to that podcast cool um but i just think it just needs to be really action-packed and give people the information they need and i you know if as long as you don't make it too fluffy like i don't think people need fluff in that yeah right i think you just you just hit them hard and it doesn't matter how long it is either I'm in. I'm in. I, cool. I, I'm going to be a subscriber. Thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate it. And uh, hopefully a guest someday as well. And, and a guest. Awesome. So, all right, guys. Well, next time we're doing video. Until then. Until then. Thanks for having us. Thanks.